When people with an interest in mafia history hear the name Charles Luciano, they often conjure an image of a unique criminal figure. He is credited with almost single-handedly establishing and later leading the most powerful criminal organization in the United States, known as the Mafia. Luciano is described as the man who reformed the Cosa Nostra and assembled an entire army of killers for the Mafia. He is seen as someone whose influence was indispensable in shaping the criminal underworld of the United States. However, this image is largely a result of the pressure exerted during his lifetime and after his death. In reality, he was neither the greatest gangster and boss of all bosses, nor a glorified phony. The truth about Charles Lucky Luciano lies somewhere in the middle. Today, we aim to present the real story of Lucky Luciano and dispel the myths surrounding his personality. Let's welcome Charles Lucky Luciano, who lived on the other side of the law. Salvatore Luciano, who would later become Charles Luciano, was born on November 11, 1897, in a small village in Sicily, Italy, to Antonio and Rosalia Luciano. His father, weary of toiling in the local mine, decided in 1906 to seek a better life in the New World, much like thousands of other immigrants. Antonio settled in New York City, and within a year, he managed to provide the means for his family to join him. In 1907, Rosalia, along with Salvatore and his older brother, made the journey to New York City. However, the New York City of that era was far from the paradise the Luciano family had hoped for. They had come in search of a better life, but found themselves mired in the same poverty they had experienced in Sicily. Instead of the smell of sulfur from the local mines, they now encountered the stench of decaying garbage. When Salvatore arrived, a strike by local janitors and garbage men was in full swing, leading to the streets of the Lower East Side, where the Luciano family had settled, being inundated with piles of refuse. The neighborhood where young Salvatore lived was a melting pot of various nationalities. It was home to people of diverse backgrounds, with a noticeable presence of Jewish, Irish and Italian communities. This aspect is crucial in understanding the development of Luciano's character. Growing up in such a culturally mixed environment allowed Salvatore to avoid prejudices against collaborating with non-Italian gangs, which would prove advantageous in the future. It also contributed to him adopting a more Americanized perspective compared to other Mafia bosses, ultimately benefiting him in the long run. At that time, besides the garbage issue that subsided after the strikes, the streets were teeming with various gangs, ranging from more prominent ones to smaller groups. The primary distinction among them was the scale of their activities, while the nature of their operations remained largely similar. Theft, robbery, racketeering, and territorial disputes. In such an environment, young Salvatore had to navigate the fine line between mundane school life and the tumultuous world of the streets. Joining a gang became almost a necessity, as an isolated existence was nearly impossible. It was particularly challenging for a solitary child to defend themselves against the attacks of other kids, which often resulted in frequent beatings and robberies. It was indeed a harsh urban jungle where survival without a group was extremely difficult. Salvatore recognized an opportunity to make a difference. His gang, like the others, engaged in robberies, but they offered a unique service as well. Italian and Irish children were often targeted by Jewish gangs. Luciano took the initiative to organize his security service for such children, providing protection in exchange for a modest fee. Many agreed to this arrangement, and Luciano's gang found a relatively legitimate way to make money. Legend has it that during this period, Salvatore crossed paths with a future partner in the illicit business, Meyer Lansky. Whether this is entirely accurate or not, the likelihood of their acquaintance even then is quite high. Both Lansky and Luciano resided in the Lower East Side at the time. It's challenging to pinpoint exactly how the paths of Salvatore and Lansky intertwined. However, there's no doubt that Salvatore's life as a young gangster took precedence over his school attendance. He rarely showed up for classes, leading to frequent visits by supervisors to his home to notify his parents. This way of life eventually landed Salvatore in a juvenile detention facility for troubled teens, where he spent four months. In 1912, at the age of 14, he emerged from this experience and decided to drop out of school. 
he secured his first legal job as a courier for Max Goodman's hat shop. However, his legal employment did not mean that he abandoned the criminal world. Salvatore once again organized a small gang with his acquaintances, engaging as runners in local drug deals. During this time, he had a falling out with his father due to the discovery of a firearm among his belongings. Salvatore continued to live this way until 1916, during which he was involved in drug distribution. In a regrettable turn of events, he provided a dose of heroin to an individual who would later turn out to be a police informant. On June 27, 1916, at the age of 18, Salvatore Luciano was sentenced to eight months in prison at New Hampton Farms Correctional Facility. Following his release, he decided to change his name from Salvatore to Charles. This decision was motivated by the fact that Salvatore had been shortened to the female name Sally during his time in prison. The other inmates used this to make relentless jokes at his expense. Evidently, Charles had had enough of it and opted for a name change. After leaving prison, Charles took up work as a ship's clerk, eventually earning an annual salary of $244, which was a substantial amount at the time. He no longer pursued illegal activities and instead focused his efforts on building a criminal enterprise. The period from 1916 to 1920 in Luciano's biography remains somewhat of a mystery with limited available information. What can be reliably established is that Charles Luciano continued to advance his criminal career after his release from prison. Some sources suggest he resumed his activities with the same gang he had been associated with before his imprisonment, while others claim he grew closer to Meyer Lansky and their partnership began to flourish. Considering that Luciano would later work with multiple criminal gangs simultaneously while simultaneously building his own criminal empire, it's plausible that both accounts are accurate. Charles Luciano consistently prioritized personal gain in his endeavors, whether it involved working with a gang or displaying loyalty. His allegiance was merely a means to enhance his personal wealth. In 1920, he found his first major opportunity for wealth accumulation as prohibition was introduced in the United States. During this period, leading up to the Castellamarese War, he established crucial connections and engaged in dealings with the future key players in the New York crime scene. Charles embarked on his Prohibition-era ventures alongside Lansky and other Jewish associates. They initiated a scheme where they robbed liquor stores and sold the stolen alcohol to bars. However, this method became less viable as liquor warehouses began running out of their stock, which had been accumulated prior to the introduction of Prohibition. In response, Luciano sought new ways to profit from the Prohibition era. Alongside his longtime partner Joe Biondo, who had recently been released from prison, he started converting legally obtained industrial alcohol into bootleg liquor. This alcohol was then used to create beverages that simulated non-alcoholic drinks to cater to the demand for spirits. Another source of bootleg alcohol was obtained by purchasing it from perfume manufacturers who used it as an ingredient in their products. Luciano's operation involved bottling this alcohol and selling it to bars. In addition to directly selling alcoholic beverages, Luciano also made money by supplying raw materials to individuals involved in moonshine production. His capital gradually increased, allowing him to establish his own distilleries and secure a contract to supply whiskey to one of the largest wholesalers at the beginning of the Prohibition era. During this time, Charles Luciano also formed a unique partnership with a notable figure in the criminal world of that era, Arnold Rothstein. Rothstein played the role of a venture capitalist, aiding Luciano in navigating the criminal underworld. Rothstein was an investor during Prohibition, putting money into the illegal ventures of various gangsters. This investment had a significant impact on the development of the well-known Jewish crime network. Luciano's association with Rothstein opened doors to him, including an entry into Jack Diamond's gang, which oversaw Rothstein's bootlegging operations. This gang was involved in a wide range of activities, from stealing property of other bootleggers to confronting rival gangsters like Dutch Schultz. While Luciano was deeply engaged with the Jewish underworld, he also nurtured connections with his fellow Italians. He built ties with the Gambino family, facilitated through his former associate Joe Biondo. Additionally, he collaborated with Frank Costello's cousin, Willie Moretti, to establish distilleries. 
One of the most valuable relationships Luciano cultivated during this period was with Joe Masseria, often known as Joe the Boss. Masseria's gang held sway over the entire Lower East Side, the very area where Luciano and Lansky were conducting their bootlegging enterprises. Eventually, Charles caught Masseria's attention, earning him a role as an enforcer in Masseria's organization in 1920. Luciano formally joined Masseria's family two years later. In 1922, Masseria fell victim to an assassination carried out by Umberto Valentini during a mafia war. However, Masseria emerged unscathed and swiftly retaliated three days later, arranging a meeting with Valentini under the pretense of reconciliation. Unbeknownst to Valentini, Masseria brought three shooters with him, one of whom was Luciano. Charles played a pivotal role in the shootout, successfully eliminating Valentini. This event paved the way for his ascent within the Masseria family. The Mafia War persisted for another year, resulting in the demise of several high-ranking members of Masseria's organization. Coupled with the fact that Luciano was proving to be a lucrative asset, the family entrusted him with the position of capo or captain within the organization in 1923. This promotion also granted him control over Masseria's gambling operations. Around the same period, Frank Costello, who would later become a close associate of Luciano, also joined the ranks of Joe Masseria's family. It's unclear whether they had known each other before Prohibition and whether they were initially in the same Mafia family, but during the Prohibition era, they developed business ties, particularly in the realm of bootlegging. During Prohibition, Luciano and his associates shared a whiskey delivery route to New York with the Irish gangster William Dwyer. Additionally, Luciano conducted business with several other gangsters who would later hold high positions within the criminal hierarchy. One of the most significant figures in Luciano's history was Vito Genovese. Despite his involvement in the Masseria family, Luciano didn't limit his activities within the family and continued to develop relationships on the side. His partnership with Lansky was so strong that they even rented a hotel room together, which served as their operational headquarters. Luciano also conducted business with Jack Diamond's crew, who were in a cold war with his immediate rival, Rothstein, one of the major heroin wholesalers in New York at the time. Luciano was still involved in the drug trade when he encountered legal trouble in 1923 for selling narcotics. Facing a second drug charge, Luciano was threatened with a 10-year sentence. To secure a favorable outcome, he decided to cooperate with law enforcement. In exchange for a complete dismissal of the charges, he provided information about the location of his own hidden assets. This decision was divisive within the criminal world, as he didn't inform on others, but instead testified against himself. This choice tarnished his reputation and cast a shadow over his standing in the criminal underworld. Despite escaping imprisonment in 1923, Luciano's life continued quietly. The only high-profile event during this period in the underworld was the death of Arnold Rothstein, which didn't have a direct impact on Luciano. Otherwise, it was business as usual, dealing in illegal alcohol and facing a few minor arrests, the routine of a gangster during those years. However, this calm period was merely the prelude to the storm that would ultimately lead Charles Luciano to his main destiny. The period of the costello maranzano War marked a revolutionary moment for both Luciano and the Italian Mafia in the United States, creating a division between the era before and after this conflict. It was the conclusion of this struggle that saw the emergence of the figures we now recognize as well as Luciano's ascent within the Mafia. Before delving into the costello maranzano War, it's worth addressing a well-known episode in Luciano's life that often comes up when discussing his biography, the legendary beating that supposedly earned him his nickname. For those unfamiliar with the story, here's a brief recap. On the evening of October 16, 1929, Luciano was invited to a meeting with Salvatore Maranzano, the leader of a faction opposed to Luciano's boss, Joe Masseria. During this encounter, Maranzano proposed that Luciano assassinate Joe the boss. Luciano declined, leading to a severe beating at the hands of Maranzano's men. When the desired response was not obtained, they reportedly tossed Luciano into a ditch. 
Sometime later, Luciano regained consciousness and managed to reach Helan Boulevard on Staten Island by one o'clock in the morning. Patrolmen picked him up and rushed him to the hospital. Meyer Lansky, his close associate, came to visit him and bestowed upon him the famous nickname Lucky. This story first surfaced in the book The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, which was written based on notes attributed to Martin Gosch, who had interviewed Luciano shortly before his death. However, it's worth noting that no one other than the book's author, Richard Hammer, claimed to have seen these notes. They were reportedly destroyed by Gosh's widow, and he passed away shortly after the alleged interview. Additionally, a substantial portion of the book was refuted by individuals directly involved in the events. Luciano himself contradicted the story, revealing the real version to Selwyn Raab, a journalist closely associated with him in the 19. There was no crime committed, and Maranzano had no connection to the beating in Luciano's account. On that fateful day, Luciano had actually been taken into custody by the police. They were investigating a murder case related to the Hotsi Totsi Club, with the prime suspect being Luciano's friend, Jack Diamond. Something went awry during the interrogation, and the police resorted to excessive force, believing Luciano was dead. Consequently, they dumped him on Staten Island and left the scene, assuming the worst. As we've discussed, it was the vigilant patrolman who found Luciano and rushed him to the hospital. The alternate story about torture by Maranzano emerged in reports from the late 1950s. However, the last testament of Lucky Luciano in the 1970s also included a narrative about the Maranzano beating. The theory of a criminal feud does not align with the available evidence, by that time, Luciano was already a high-ranking member of the Masseria faction, and it's implausible that Maranzano would have allowed him to survive such a violent assault, potentially creating a formidable enemy. It's worth mentioning that if the story about Maranzano's involvement in Luciano's beating were accurate, it would have been concluded already discussing Luciano's grand funeral as his nickname Lucky would have been linked to this event. Moreover, Maya Lansky had no role in coining this nickname, in fact, newspapers were using the moniker Lucky a few years before this time. This nickname actually stemmed from Luciano's childhood and was derived from an abbreviation of his surname, Luciano, which can be transformed into the word luck. However, despite the debunking of the Maranzano beating story, Maranzano plays a pivotal role in the history of the Costello-Maranzano War. Maranzano arrived in the United States in 1925 fleeing Mussolini's fascist regime in Italy. He swiftly gained respect among his compatriots in the United States, thanks to the backing of Don Vito Cascio, a prominent mafia figure with connections to Italy. Maranzano, like many others, was involved in bootlegging, which became the primary catalyst for the brewing conflict between him and Joe Masseria. By this time, Masseria had already earned the title of boss of all bosses, this set the stage for tensions and sporadic attacks between the Maranzano and Masseria factions as they vied for supremacy in the underworld. The Costello-Maranzano War had several factors contributing to its outbreak. First, Maranzano supported Al Capone in his conflict with one of Joe Aiello's associates in Chicago. He also aimed to eliminate Casper Amel from the scene. Second, the desire for control and expansion was a significant driving force. Masseria sought to seize as much power as possible, which didn't sit well with other organized crime figures. The open conflict initiated with two notable murders. In February 1930, Gaetano Reina, who had defected from the Masseria faction and begun cooperating with Maranzano, was assassinated. Then, in May of the same year, Giuseppe Morello was killed. In the context of Luciano's story, it's not only crucial to know who was killed and when, but also to understand Luciano's actions at the time. Luciano was distancing himself from the conflict, possibly even traveling to Germany with Jack Diamond in late August for his own drug smuggling ventures. At this point, the violence and constant murders began drawing additional attention to illegal activities from law enforcement agencies, which posed a financial burden. Gradually, Many participants in the conflict began arriving at a similar realization, that Masseria's organization was clearly on the losing side. Doubts began to emerge about Masseria's leadership, further destabilizing the situation. 
In addition to the mounting violence, Maranzano simultaneously made a declaration that he only sought the death of Masseria and wouldn't pursue other participants in the conflict. By the spring of 1931, Maranzano's offer was accepted. Luciano and his associates confirmed their readiness to organize Masseria's assassination. On April 15th of that year, Joe, the boss Masseria, was assassinated in a Coney Island restaurant, and Luciano openly took responsibility for this act. As Nick Jean Kelly mentioned in his biography, Luciano conveyed the message to Maranzano that the murder of Joe the Boss was executed for his own benefit and at Maranzano's desire. Kelly added that pursuing anyone from the former Masseria faction would inevitably lead to a resurgence of violence. Maranzano accepted the terms of his victory shortly after Joe the Boss's demise, effectively ending the war. He called for a general meeting of Sicilian gangsters in the Bronx to celebrate his triumph and lay the foundation for the familiar structure of the New York Mafia. During this meeting, it was established that all Sicilian gangs would be unified into the five families, led by a boss. Luciano assumed leadership of the former Masseria family, with his underboss being Vito Genovese. Joseph Bonanno became the head of the Bonanno family, Joe Profaci took charge of the future Colombo family, Tom Galliano was entrusted with the future Lucchese family, and the new Gambino family was led by Vincent Mangano. Overseeing all five families was Maranzano, who held the title of boss of all bosses. However, Maranzano's reign in this high-status role was short-lived. He aspired to attain unchecked power, much like Masseria, which did not sit well with his former adversaries from the Costello-Maranzano War, and gradually alienated even his supporters. Later recollections noted that Maranzano's style of organization did not resonate with the younger generation of Sicilians raised in America. Maranzano aimed to establish a dictatorial regime by eliminating those who posed a potential threat to his power, which included figures like Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Willie Moretti, and several prominent Jewish gangsters, among others. The first target for elimination was Luciano, followed by Irish gangster Vincent Mad Dog Coll. However, Maranzano did not have the opportunity to carry out these orders. Luciano got wind of both the hit list and Maranzano's impending assassination. First, he verified the existence of the hit list, ensuring those at the top of it and those who could potentially oppose Maranzano were aware of the threat. Then, with the support of various gangsters, he began to prepare for the assassination of the boss of all bosses. In September 1931, Maranzano ran into issues with the Internal Revenue Service, and Luciano got wind of this situation. Concerned that the boss of all bosses might employ desperate measures to escape scrutiny or cover his tracks, Luciano decided to capitalize on the opportunity. He sent assassins to Maranzano's office who posed as agents from the Internal Revenue Service. The assassins gained access to the office without much difficulty, executed Maranzano, and made their escape before the authorities arrived. The murder was executed with remarkable ease, effectively ending the era of the boss of all bosses in the Italian Mafia in America. On the same day and the following night of Maranzano's murder, a widespread legend emerged, suggesting that several dozen more henchmen of the boss of all bosses were assassinated across the United States. This event was famously dubbed the Night of the Sicilian. However, it's challenging to find reliable sources that can name even a fraction of the supposed Maranzano supporters who were killed during this supposed night of violence. This myth appears to have been artificially created, and even the extensive records of the time refute the occurrence of such events. Furthermore, the Night of the Sicilian is denied in the The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, which labels it as pure imagination. It's important to note that many individuals were already dissatisfied with Maranzano, and Luciano openly emphasized that the boss of all bosses' death was a preemptive, defensive act, breaking no promises made during the conclusion of the Costello-Maranzano War. Consequently, it made no sense for both Luciano and Maranzano's supporters to prolong the conflict. They proceeded with their respective endeavors quietly, without revisiting the violence. This marked the end of the boss of all bosses title, with the subsequent establishment of a commission overseeing mafia affairs. 
While the reorganization is often attributed to Charles Lucky Luciano, suggesting that he had nurtured the idea for several years, it's essential to clarify that this notion is incorrect. Contrary to the portrayal in The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, a commission was indeed created during the costello Maranzano War, and Costello briefly proclaimed himself the boss of all bosses. However, this idea was not pursued further. Accounts from that era, as reported by figures like Nick Gentile, confirm that the concept of the commission was not solely Luciano's personal initiative. Charles was just one of many supporters advocating for the abolition of the boss of all bosses title and the creation of the commission. The commission itself functioned as a governing body tasked with resolving disputes and making decisions through a voting process. It included the bosses of the five New York families and extended to figures like Al Capone in Chicago and Frank Milano in Cleveland. One controversial fact about the commission is the chairmanship, with some sources suggesting that Luciano was its first chairman, while others contend that Vincent Mangano held this role until his death. Even if Luciano were the initial chairman, his vote held no more weight than that of the other members. The chairman in the commission did not have the authority and prominence associated with the former boss of all bosses, as there were typically at least three individuals in this leadership role. It's crucial to emphasize that the commission was not a gathering of Luciano's personal allies or associates. Members could lobby any of the other bosses as needed. Despite this, Luciano was content with the situation as he could conduct his own business, manage his family, collaborate with necessary individuals, and most importantly, there was no longer a powerful figure above him who could disrupt his organization with a single word. Luciano had finally achieved the independence he desired, enabling him to pursue his business ventures and ensure peace and order within the Italian Mafia. We could argue that this period finally brought order to the Costa Nostra. Although conflicts and skirmishes in the New York underworld persisted, and Luciano was directly involved in some of them, the years from 19 were undoubtedly the golden era for Luciano. By then, he had established a successful drug smuggling operation and was in the process of creating an extensive network of brothels. These ventures became his primary sources of income following the end of Prohibition, ultimately helping Luciano amass a multi-million dollar fortune that allowed him to lead a life of opulence without any financial constraints. Before delving into Luciano's lifestyle during this peak period and how his organization operated, it's essential to discuss the so-called National Crime Syndicate. This crime syndicate, as it is commonly perceived, was a vast criminal entity that had a presence throughout most of the United States. It comprised various criminal gangs, each with its defined territories and operations, all overseen by a special counsel led by Luciano. However, in reality, the existence of the National Crime Syndicate remains a subject of debate among researchers. Even if it did exist, it likely wasn't a centralized corporation with hierarchical management. Instead, it functioned as a syndicate, an association of independent businesses collaborating for mutual profit. The gatherings of the syndicate primarily revolved around discussions about future investments, such as ventures in gambling, including Las Vegas and Cuba, and, according to unverified reports, contributions to election campaigns of some presidential candidates. However, how the participants raised funds for these joint investments was of little concern to the syndicate. Each boss had the freedom to pursue their business activities independently. Not even Lucky Luciano, who was not the overall boss of the Italian Mafia, suddenly became the leader of the entire criminal underworld in the United States. At that time, Luciano was more focused on advancing his personal interests and businesses than asserting dominance over the entire country's criminal activities. Prohibition was on the verge of repeal, and Luciano was diligently working to establish new revenue streams. He initiated the construction of his heroin smuggling network, a venture that began before he even joined the Mafia. While his 1930 trip to Germany didn't yield success, Luciano was fortunate to have a longtime comrade from the Lower East Side named Delgra, who aided in completing his heroin smuggling network by the end of 1931. This network provided Luciano with a direct heroin route into New York City. 
Within a short span, Luciano's drug operations expanded well beyond the Lower East Side and reached the West Coast by 1934, notably Hollywood, which proved to be a lucrative market for drug dealers. However, relatively little is known about Luciano's involvement in the drug trade compared to his bootlegging and racketeering activities. Additionally, Luciano was a prominent figure in the world of brothels. He meticulously crafted a well-oiled machine for managing New York City's brothels, where each cog had its designated place. This system operated efficiently, generating substantial profits for its owner, but at a significant cost to the lives of countless young women. The framework established by Charles Luciano essentially operated as a form of sexual slavery. Following the end of Prohibition, many individuals in the criminal world sought new avenues for wealth accumulation. Some, like Frank Costello, ventured into slot machines, while Luciano, among others, entered the drug trade. Nevertheless, Luciano was unique in recognizing the brothels scattered across New York City as a potential gold mine. Through intimidation and coercion, he rapidly assumed control over the entire brothel industry in the city. This nefarious establishment was referred to as the Combination. At the top of this illicit hierarchy was Luciano himself, and immediately below him was an organized crime group known as the Moss Street Mafia. This group was represented by leaders such as Abby Heller, Dave Attila, Jim Frederick, and Tommy Bino. Beneath them were the pimps responsible for managing the prostitutes. The system functioned by prostitutes attracting clients and paying a portion of their earnings, while pimps paid a fixed fee to a booker for each girl they brought into the brothels. This intricate network allowed Luciano to control and profit from the entire prostitution industry. Simultaneously, both madams and bookers within the brothels contributed a percentage of their earnings, which ultimately found its way into Luciano's coffers. The Mott Street Mafia was tasked with the responsibility of collecting these funds and maintaining order within this intricate system. They also received a percentage of the profits, serving as intermediaries between the prostitutes, bookers and Luciano. However, a glaring issue with this system lay in the fate of the prostitutes themselves. These women entered the brothels through various means, rarely of their own volition, they were often enticed from other cities with promises of good jobs in New York. In some cases, particularly attractive bookers would seduce unsuspecting girls. Regardless of how they were initially lured, once within the brothel, they shared a common experience. Initially, these women were subjected to repeated rape to break their spirit. Following this traumatic experience, they were introduced to narcotics, subsequently becoming addicted to these substances. This not only ensured that the girls would return all their earnings to Luciano by purchasing drugs from him, but also prevented them from escaping the brothels as drug dependence became their sole means of survival. Within this system, the prostitutes had all of their hard-earned money confiscated. Once they lost their physical appeal, they were unceremoniously cast onto the streets to face an uncertain future. This merciless cycle of exploitation was central to Luciano's financial success. This new enterprise contributed substantially to Luciano's already substantial income, which included the proceeds from his involvement in drug trafficking and the wealth he had accumulated during Prohibition. This substantial wealth allowed Charles Luciano to live a life of opulence and comfort without having to deprive himself of any luxuries. Nonetheless, Luciano's lifestyle diverged significantly from that of Al Capone, who was known for extravagant parties and conspicuous public appearances. Luciano preferred to remain in the shadows, believing that excessive attention could harm his illicit enterprises. He maintained no permanent residence, opting for rented rooms and hotels where he could enjoy fleeting relationships without commitments. Luciano shunned interviews and aimed to keep his name as discreet as possible, rarely allowing it to be uttered aloud. However, in due course, an individual entered his life who would thrust the name of Charles Luciano into the spotlight and make it resonate across the entire United States. Until 1931, prominent criminals in New York City led lives of relative ease as they had effectively purchased the cooperation of authorities who often turned a blind eye to their illicit activities. However, the arrival of the incorruptible prosecutor Thomas Dewey marked a significant shift. 
Dewey initiated a relentless crusade against organized crime, his first target being the relatively petty operation of illegal lotteries in Harlem. Dewey's initial prosecutions, including those of individuals like Henry Miro for tax evasion, left him realizing that he had merely scratched the surface of the criminal underworld. There were dozens more like Miro operating throughout Harlem. Dewey was also astute enough to comprehend the vast profits such medium-sized gangs could generate, earning them at least a million dollars annually. This led him to contemplate the immense financial scope of the entire criminal enterprise. Armed with this realization, Dewey intensified his investigative efforts. By early 1933, he had gathered sufficient evidence against two major gangs. He closely monitored the activities of Waxy Gordon and Dutch Schultz, ultimately securing a tax evasion conviction against Gordon in the same year. However, Schultz remained a formidable target. In addition to his investigative and evidential work, Dewey also sought to influence public opinion. He took to the radio to expose the extent of organized crime's influence in the country, emphasizing its infiltration of various social institutions. Through these broadcasts, Dewey cultivated a symbolic image of a vast octopus with far-reaching tentacles capable of ensnaring anyone in its grasp. These efforts laid the foundation for the myth of Charles Luciano as the preeminent gangland boss. Simultaneously, while Schultz was under the watchful eye of the authorities, he struggled to maintain control over his criminal organization. Schultz's mounting stress and pressure prompted a descent into violence, making him increasingly unpredictable. Eventually, Schultz decided to deal with Dewey in the customary underworld manner, plotting the prosecutor's murder in a bid to eliminate his relentless pursuer. Schultz's scheme to assassinate Dewey became widely known to other criminal bosses, each perceiving a compelling motive to eliminate the prosecutor and further divide territories and spheres of influence among themselves. This situation set the stage for a significant turning point in the unfolding narrative of Charles Luciano and his ascent within the criminal hierarchy. On October 23, 1935, a hired assassin gunned down Dutch Schultz and his associates in a New Jersey cafe, unbeknownst to Charles Luciano, who had effectively issued a death warrant for Schultz. This action marked Luciano's assertion of his authority and solidified his position within the criminal world. However, Thomas Dewey, the relentless prosecutor, found himself in need of a new target after Schultz's death, which had eluded him until then. Little did he know that he would soon expose Luciano to the spotlight, forcing him out of the shadows where he had meticulously concealed himself. In reality, Dewey had begun to investigate Luciano's case months prior to Schultz's murder. His focus, unbeknownst to him, was the trail of Luciano's brothels. In July 1935, concerned citizens had prompted Dewey to address the increasing cases of homosexual and heterosexual prostitution on the streets of New York. Dewey responded to the request, embarking on a thorough investigation. As he delved deeper into the matter, he discovered an organized group orchestrating the entire operation. His journey led him to realize that prostitution, both heterosexual and homosexual, was just a part of the larger criminal enterprise. In February 1936, Dewey organized a raid on brothels, resulting in the arrest and interrogation of 125 prostitutes. Through these interrogations, investigators pieced together the entire structure of Luciano's syndicate. Now, all Dewey had to do was assemble the evidence and bring charges against Luciano. However, a legal complication arose. The trial would not take place as expected because the defendant, Charles Luciano, had learned of the impending trial and fled New York for the town of Hot Springs. Upon discovering Luciano's escape, Dewey issued a request for a writ of habeas corpus to extradite Luciano back to New York for trial. In a twist of fate, the local judge set Luciano's bail at $5,000 instead of the requested $1,000, which was promptly paid by Luciano. This decision allowed Luciano to remain at large. After posting bail in April 1936, Charles intended to flee to Mexico but arrived in Hot Springs instead. There, he managed to persuade a local judge to issue a warrant for Luciano's arrest without bail. Luciano found himself frustrated and was placed back in a local jail. During his time there, he enjoyed comfortable accommodations provided by the local administration. However, 
Luciano's extradition to New York was refused, based on an alleged local court conviction that prevented him from leaving Arkansas. In response, Dewey, through the governor of Arkansas, took direct action to seize the prison where Luciano was held by local rangers. Subsequently, Luciano was transferred to a prison in the state capital, where conditions were less favorable. From there, he was ultimately transported to New York. Luciano's attorneys had limited time to appeal his extradition from Arkansas. In a subsequent trial, Luciano was found guilty and sentenced to 35 years in prison, marking the longest sentence of anyone involved in that case. This was also the first time a gangster of such prominence had been successfully sentenced to prison for reasons other than tax evasion. With this trial, Dewey made Luciano the epitome of organized crime, forever associating his name with the cover of the book, even if that cover was not the essence of the book itself. During Luciano's imprisonment, the power of his family initially shifted to Vito Genovese, who sought to exert full control for himself. However, Frank Costello frequently visited Luciano in prison and effectively took charge of the family. Even in prison, Luciano continued to manage the Mafia family through Costello. He also entrusted the management of his personal assets and funds to his old friend and partner, Meyer Lansky. Luciano never lost hope of appealing his conviction and obtaining a case review. His attorneys fought for his release for several years. However, what ultimately led to Charles's release from prison was the impending outbreak of World War II and his assistance to the U.S. Navy. Starting in the 1930s, the American underworld unofficially began assisting the U.S. authorities in their fight against fascist elements. The Italian Mafia, which faced persecution in their homeland under Mussolini's regime, opposed the fascist supporters in the United States. Jewish gangsters also fought against American fascist sympathizers due to their treatment of Jewish people. This history of informal cooperation laid the groundwork for later formal collaboration with the authorities. In December 1941, when the United States officially entered World War II, the country faced significant challenges from German submarines that attacked ships leaving the port of New York. Additionally, there were reports of Nazi saboteurs operating at local docks. The breaking point that led U.S. Navy leaders to consider seeking help from the criminal underworld was the fire on February 9, 1942, which incapacitated the cruiser Normandy and resulted in the loss of millions of dollars in cargo, including vital war supplies. Two versions of the story surround the cause of this catastrophe. One version suggests that German saboteurs were responsible, while the other attributes it to the Italian Mafia, acting under orders from Charles Luciano. Regardless of which version is correct, the Navy subsequently turned to the gangsters who controlled the port for assistance. They approached a gangster named Joe Lanza, who had influence over the port workers' unions and the fish trade. Lanza was already under investigation at the time, but agreed to assist naval intelligence even without any direct promises of dropped charges. This cooperation by Lanza was later discovered by Meyer Lansky, a close associate of Luciano, who had known Lanza for many years. Seeing an opportunity to help his old friend Luciano, Lansky requested that Lanza guide the Navy representatives to someone with even more power than he had. By doing so, Lanza directed the Navy to Lucky Luciano, who had significant influence in the criminal world. The Navy officials were pleased with the results of their cooperation with Lanza and decided to explore the possibility of working with Luciano. This marked the beginning of a unique collaboration between the U.S. government and the criminal underworld. Following Joe Lanza's recommendation, the U.S. Navy promptly contacted Charles Luciano's lawyer, Moses Polakoff, who directed them to Meyer Lansky. Lansky, who had previously facilitated the initial contact between naval intelligence and the Genovese family boss, continued to be a key liaison in these dealings. Luciano's terms of cooperation with the Navy were essentially the same as Lansky's. He made the agreement without any specific promises or guarantees, except for the opportunity to take pride in supporting his country. However, Luciano had one vital condition. The collaboration had to remain a closely guarded secret. The revelation of such cooperation could have serious consequences for him in Italy, where he was to be deported at the end of his prison term. The collaboration with the Navy proved advantageous for both parties. 
the Navy achieved success in dealing with the German saboteurs, while Luciano gained more freedom to engage in various affairs with Lansky and Costello, serving as his liaisons in the arrangement. A significant consequence of this collaboration was the perpetuation of the myth of Luciano as the king of the underworld. This misconception primarily emerged due to Thomas Dewey's efforts during the trial, Lansky's request and negotiations with the government, and Luciano's indispensable assistance. When the issue of German saboteurs was resolved, and American troops were preparing to land in Italy, Luciano's knowledge and contacts in his homeland became invaluable. He provided the intelligence community with vital information regarding Italy's geography, locals, and the logistics of their operations. This information greatly aided the U.S. offensive in Italy, contributing to the Allied victory. Despite being promised nothing in return for his assistance, Luciano received his reward after the war concluded. In February 1946, he was released from custody and deported to Italy. From that point on, he would never set foot in the country that had once become his home. At the age of 48, Charles Luciano regained his freedom but remained forever marked by his past. Following his release, Luciano was escorted to Ellis Island, where he awaited his departure. The day before leaving, he received visits from some of the gangsters with whom he had conducted business for years. Notable figures like Maya Lansky, Frank Costello, and others bid him farewell. After bidding his colleagues and friends goodbye, Luciano left the United States on a cargo ship. He arrived in Italy 17 days later, marking his return. Upon disembarking, he was taken to a local police station for questioning about his presence in the area. After a brief interview, Luciano was released. He then traveled to Sicily and stayed at his parents' home. Despite being thousands of miles from his American operations, he spent a few months with his relatives. During his time in Italy, Luciano began devising a plan to return to the United States. His strong desire to re-engage with the business he had built over many years, the fruits of which he had never fully enjoyed due to his imprisonment, was a major motivator. Additionally, the knowledge that Vito Genovese, who had sought to take control of the family, was back in America, drove Luciano to consider a return. Luciano was not deterred by the risk of being apprehended upon re-entry, which could have led to serving the remaining 25 years of his sentence. He explored different routes to return to the States, and the first option he considered was through Mexico. The FBI received reports about possible flights in July to September 19th, but failed to secure concrete leads. Despite their efforts, Luciano managed to evade their grasp, raising the possibility that it was a deliberate test of the waters. The second method, which had already been officially confirmed, was traveling via Cuba. The Island of Liberty maintained an unofficial connection to the United States, with just an hour's flight from Miami. This approach allowed Luciano to oversee his American operations without physically crossing the border. Furthermore, Charles Luciano's longtime associate, Meyer Lansky, had ambitious plans to establish a gambling empire in Cuba. Luciano was poised to invest a significant amount of money in this endeavor, seeing it as an ideal opportunity. Luciano arrived on the shores of Cuba in late 1946. Some sources suggest he flew there directly from Mexico, while others claim he arrived from Italy. Thanks to Lansky's connections and the groundwork laid since the early 1930s, Luciano had an official visa for Cuba, allowing for a smooth entry. Shortly after Luciano's arrival in Cuba, the famous Havana Mafia Conference took place, bringing together nearly all the key crime bosses. The central agenda of the conference revolved around investing in the Cuban gambling industry. After extensive discussions, they decided to support this idea, primarily spearheaded by Meyer Lansky. Another crucial topic at the convention was the fate of Benjamin Siegel, who was constructing the Flamingo Casino in Las Vegas. Many gangsters had invested in the establishment and were displeased that Siegel's girlfriend, Virginia Hill, had been diverting some of the allocated construction funds to her Swiss bank accounts. Despite Lansky's defense of Siegel, the convention voted for Siegel's death. As anticipated, this convention drew the attention of American authorities, given their belief that Luciano was leading the criminal underworld in the United States. Consequently, they decided to expel Luciano from the United States, 
The FBI and the Drug Enforcement Administration were involved in this matter, and after pressuring Italian authorities, Luciano was eventually expelled from the United States on March 20, 19. Upon his arrival in Italy, Luciano spent nine days in prison in Genoa, after which he was transferred to Palermo, where he faced another period of arrest. After spending 18 days in detention, he was finally released and allowed to leave for Rome, where he rented an apartment and had the opportunity to contemplate his next steps in more favorable circumstances. The U.S. authorities had made it abundantly clear that they wouldn't allow Charles Luciano anywhere near the country, making it almost impossible for him to continue running operations in New York. While he did receive some funds from past investments and favors owed to him by the New York Mafia, and Frank Costello could send cash on behalf of his family when he was the boss, it was insufficient compared to the earnings he could generate by being directly involved in business. Luciano needed something in Italy that could provide a significant income. One avenue could have been drug smuggling, although it's widely believed that Charles wasn't a central figure in organizing the delivery of heroin to the United States. The facts tell a different story. Shortly after his expulsion from Cuba, Luciano visited heroin-producing countries. These movements did not escape the attention of the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics, which heightened its surveillance of Luciano and pressured Italian law enforcement agencies. Throughout the 1950s, Luciano found himself under scrutiny from U.S. authorities, and his movements within Italy were restricted. His passport was confiscated to prevent him from leaving Italy, and local mafiosi were wary of conducting legitimate business with him due to his notoriety. Rumors of his wartime cooperation with authorities during World War II only added to their skepticism. Despite these challenges, Luciano was still respected in Italy, mainly because of his friendship with a powerful local boss. If Luciano had indeed played a central role in drug smuggling during those years, given the corruption of the Italian police, it's unlikely he would have faced such widespread law enforcement scrutiny. His true position within the Italian Mafia at the time can be illustrated by examining a local Mafia story. Antonio Calderoni, a small Neapolitan hooligan, once dared to slap Luciano in the face, though he later met his demise. This incident serves as an example of how Charles was not the mastermind behind drug smuggling. This is further corroborated by the fact that in 1957, Joe Bonanno negotiated a cooperation deal to deliver drugs to the United States, not with Luciano, but with the Sicilian Giuseppe Genco Russo. Luciano wasn't even invited to the meeting. Despite all the attention from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and Italian police, as well as numerous arrests and interrogations related to drug trafficking, there hasn't been any substantial progress in linking Luciano to drug-related activities. After his expulsion from Cuba, Luciano was eager to establish a lucrative venture in Italy, but he had to rely on financial support from his friends in America. However, this income gradually dwindled. First, Frank Costello, his close friend, stepped down as the boss of the family under pressure from Vito Genovese, and the payment ceased. Then, a revolution in Cuba significantly reduced Luciano's investments in the gambling business. Luciano sought to improve his financial situation by selling a film about his life, and had even begun writing a screenplay. He entered into a contract that would have earned him $100,000 and a percentage of the film's earnings. However, he received a clear warning from acquaintances in New York who strongly discouraged the film adaptation. Taking this warning seriously, Luciano was scheduled to meet with film producer Barnett Glass, but he tragically suffered a heart attack at the airport on January 26, 1962. Luciano's heart problems had plagued him for some time, and this attack proved fatal. On January 29, 1962, a memorial service was held for him in Naples, attended by close relatives, a few minor gangsters, and numerous police officers. Among prominent mobsters, only Joe Adonis came to pay his respects. Luciano's lifelong friend, Meyer Lansky, had his remains transported to America, where he was buried in the family crypt in Queens. This concludes the story of Charles Lucky Luciano, one of the most mythologized gangsters in American history whose role in the underworld when compared to the legends may have been somewhat exaggerated.
If you've enjoyed this video and want more heart-pounding content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Stay vigilant, stay fearless, and stay tuned for more bone-chilling adventures on Survival Horror Channel. Thanks for watching, and until next time.